Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the House on the Rock on behalf of Titi Radun and Timi Ogubanjo and the, all of the Ogubanjo and Kuku families to this service of songs for Pamufi Abimbola Olurutmi Ogubanjo, a dear father, brother, friend, and colleague. I welcome you all to this service of songs and may I ask you to rise for the procession. Thank you. The processional hymn, O God Beyond All Praising.
Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good evening, church. Dearly beloved, we're gathered this evening to worship God and to celebrate the timeless legacy of a husband, father, brother, friend, uncle, and colleague. A prince who is a thoroughbred legal practitioner and a renowned capital market professional as well as a distinguished Nigerian. The Bar Mufi of Erunwa Kingdom in Ijebu land. Abimbola Olurotimi Ogumbanjo OFR and to comfort all who mourn is call to the heavenly shores. The prophet Isaiah assures us that when the righteous are taken suddenly, we need to understand that they are taken away to spare them from evil. The Bible also encourages us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Therefore, beloved brethren, this evening, we believe that the power of God is here to comfort each and every one of us in his presence tonight. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless your name because you are the God of all flesh. It is from you that all spirit emanate. You are the God of all. We bless your name for the life and times of your son. The one that you have since called to your bosom. As we celebrate him tonight, we give you the glory that you alone deserve. We thank you for the power of your presence. We thank you for the comforting spirit. We bless your name, O oh God, because the joy of your spirit will terminate every spirit of heaviness in this place. Therefore, we commit and commend the entire family into your care from tonight. We ask that in the name of Jesus that you will do that which you alone can do. In this service tonight, we come with joy unspeakable in our spirit and ask, O oh God, that your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Come on, I need to hear you say amen. Please, with Jesus' joy in our hearts, let us receive the music ministry of the Lagos Metropolitan Gospel Choir as they lead us in praise and worship. for the praise and worship there is joy kindly please stand for the praise and worship our feet together there's no one like you jesus there's no one like you lord in all the earth there's no one like you jesus oh there's no one like you you don't mind the things, you do glorious things. You're a faithful God and also miss your singing. You do mind, you do glorious things. You're a faithful God, faithful God, also miss your Sing it again, you do You cannot do. There is nothing you cannot do. Sing, Lord, as the maze. Stand the maze in your breast. There is joy, peace, and hope, Lord. 
bless you. Lord, we exalt you. You're the one who is higher than the highest. And you sit on the annals and the circles of all existence. You're the one who takes decisions in the annals of power. You're the one who says a thing and it doesn't return to you void, but accomplishes that which you have spoken it to do. You're the one who gave even death a purpose, resurrection. You're the one who snatched the power out of death and gave mankind hope. You're the one whose blood speaks 
from ages past to age to come. The perfect sacrifice that paid the price for man. And because of that, we have a hope. We have glory. So in life, you did not only guarantee life. You gave us abundant life. We bless your holy name. We worship you in the beauty of who you are. Accept all our thanks and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we have worshipped. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I know it can be a little bit difficult for you. But our commandment is that in all things, in all circumstance, in all situation, we should give praise. And that's why we're praising God this evening. Our brother is in a better place because a blood spoke on his behalf. And he accepted the entirety of the provision of the blood. The sacrifice has spoken. Life well spent. To live is Christ and to die is gain. We should be rejoicing because God has taken the fire, has taken the bite out of death. Blessed be the name of our Lord and our God forever. I thought you said an amen in there. I will just enjoin you to keep standing for a little while longer as we take our first hymn this morning. If you turn to your uh, directive hymn books, you'll see the hymn there. It's titled, In Christ Alone. We will be led by the Lagos Metropolitan Gospel Choir. Please sing along. God bless you all.
I think it's okay to have your seats. We're taking our first Bible reading for the evening. It is taken from the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, from verse 21 to 26. We will be reading from the New King James Version. Please let us uh, appreciate as we usher up the daughter, Miss Ladun Ogubanjo, as she comes to read. Please let's put our hands together for her. Thank you. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Thank you. Praise the Lord. I can understand. At times it's so difficult, even as Christians, to say praise the Lord at such a time as this. But we have the word of God to help us. And so I plead with you just to open your hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to comfort you. He's the one who loves our brother more than anybody here. We'll soon be taking the tributes. I implore you to please keep to time, just two minutes. We all have something good to say about our, our son, our brother, husband, and father. I'm going to be calling on Bodon Adebayo to Read the Bible reading for today in First Corinthians 15, 51 to 56. Now that you know that we have a solace in the word of God, everybody, please praise the Lord. You can do better than that. Amen. Put your hands together to make him feel warm and welcome. The second Bible reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 56. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immor immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Here ends the reading. Praise the Lord. In a few moments, in a few moments we will receive physical tributes from pre people present here. We would like to admonish all speakers to please keep your speeches brief to enable us get through this evening quickly. But for the moment, please turn your attention to the multimedia screens as we bring you video greetings from a few friends. Hi, my name is Umi Williams. 
I'm Uncle Bimbala's niece. He was my personal person. I think I met him around age seven. He was friends with my older brother, Femi, in London. And uh, I think that's my first picture of him walking into the house because they were about to go out to a nightclub or something. And they used to dress uh, in a similar way. Leather pants, silk shirt, medallion, and just, and those dimples. For about 45 years, I didn't know him as Abimbola. I knew him as either Craigo or Alfonso. He was a sincere gentleman, but I just simply referred to him as brother me because that was what it was to me. I remember, I will not mention names, we crashed the Jaguar of one of our parents. We all knew who the driver was, but because of who he is, someone else took the rap. He would always say to me, won't start, make sure you live your best. I mean, when I was turning 25, uncle was like, where's the party at, where's the party at? I've known Apimbola since we were teenagers, a few years older than me. Many years ago, when himself and our darling Titlola married, two good friends getting married, and it was a joyous, joyous occasion. From our earliest days as childhood companions to our later roles as leaders in our respective communities, the ties that bound our families together reached back for over a century. We were both alumni of the Bobby College, as were our fathers, who earned their LLBs at the University of London, pursued further postgraduate education at Lincoln's Inn, and were subsequently called to the English bar before practicing law here in Nigeria as brothers. Alphonse was probably the most academically orientated, you know, that wanted to go to class more than anybody. Bimbo, being who he was, always wanted to make peace. I've heard people call him conservative. I was dating an Arab girl at that particular time, and I think the Arab boys didn't find that particularly funny. So they were always wanting to have a go at me, and to have a go at me, they always wanted to go through Bimbo. And Bimbo would then come back to me, dare me, Jimmy, leave these people alone. He comes from a dignified family, a good name, so that's always what was first for him and he was always putting himself out for other people. He always used to look up to people in the business industry. The person he looked up to probably the most was his own father. There was a day that I actually went to see him in his apartment. The phone rang and he was just lying down with toothpick in his mouth. As he picked up the phone, he just heard one voice, Abimbala, and that was his father. The way he jumped from lying down with his feet on the couch to sitting on the edge of the couch and saying, Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And as if his father was right, he was standing right in front of his father. Me, myself, I ran out of his apartment. <laughs> it was just a funny thing. Somewhere along the line, when he got back to Nigeria, and I think um, he realized what uh, Papa had done something deep inside him just started propelling him. He wanted to match up with Papa. You understand what I'm saying? Even though Papa's shoes were big, but <sighs> looking back, he more or less paralleled it. Now we will welcome the Rock Cathedral Gospel Choir as they lead us in the hymn, How Great Thou Art. Would we all please stand?
How Great Thy Art was Abimbola Ogubanjo's favorite hymn. And I'm pretty sure the favorite for very many of us here in this room this evening. Bimbo followed his father into Igbobi College and followed his father's corporate law and into the stock exchange. He was, of course, a past president of the stock exchange. So it's only fitting that our first tribute this evening will be from Mr. Timmy Bukwola, president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. He's not here with us. He'll be a video. And he's also from Igbubi, which is also the alma mater for both Bimbo and his father. My name is Temi Bubwala. I am the group CEO for Nigerian Exchange Group PLC. I first of all cross paths, I would say, a bit more directly with Bamufi just over three years ago as I was getting into consideration for the role as Chief Executive Officer for the uh, exchange, Nigerian Exchange Limited. Uh, of course, before then, uh, considering the family that he comes from, I'd heard about the family, I'd heard about him and uh, his brother and uh, many of the things that the family has been very well known for. But uh, as we interacted a bit more closely, I came to really genuinely value and appreciate the relationship. I remember the very first time that we met, he had called me out of the blues that he got my phone number. Uh, and as you would normally expect in a scenario like that, I should be the one looking for him, considering that he was the chairman of the exchange and I was the one looking for a role at the exchange. But very quickly, as the relationship started off, it was clearly one that devolved in the end to a mentorship type of relationship. He was extremely helpful as I went through that process. Uh, he really believed in me. Uh, I think that's one of the things that lasts with me the most. I remember one meeting that we had with uh, perhaps one of our most important stakeholders and he had said very kind words that if there was anybody who would be able to fill the very big shoes that the former group CEO was leaving, that it was myself and those things have been very, very helpful for me. Uh, three things that as I think through uh, the time that we spent together that I continue to remember. One was his genuine desire for young people to grow, to blossom. He had a very, very genuine desire, keen interest in making sure that people can flourish. He helped me through not just that process to get in, but always made it clear that I could rely on him. Number two, I really liked his love for his family. He was a very big, devoted family man. He, at different times, would ask me to spend time with Rotimi, to mentor him, to encourage him. And I really value that um, very much. Of course, his wife as well, and Tititi. We also grew to have quite a good relationship, uh, and I value that very much. Number three, of course, if you knew him well, you would know that he liked the finer things of life. Uh, a very good evening with him was to be somewhere like the Capital Club or a nice restaurant, you know, having a nice meal with a very good bottle of wine. And uh, I struggled to think of better things and better experiences in Lagos. So as we uh, just look back to the remarkable life that he lived, I am grateful that our paths crossed. I am extremely thankful for the role that he has played in my life, that he has played in my career. Uh, I'm very grateful that I had the privilege, the opportunity to uh, be a bit closer to his family. And I would certainly look to continue to dip in that. So as we celebrate the life today uh, with very heavy hearts, I just want to pray that uh, his soul rests in perfect peace. Thank you very much, Mr. Temi Pokola, who is actually, I think, the CEO of the Nigerian Exchange Group and didn't go to Igbobi College as far as I know. I might be re-educated about that from the person who is actually representing Igbobi College here this evening, Mr. Kende Kasumu. Kende Ayo Kasumu, would you please come up to give your tribute? Another lawyer, but more than that, a close family friend and I can say that is for decades.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have set up this tribute, and I call it a doer's legacy. It's a tribute that has been put together by Messrs. Bayo Fisher, Guega Domingo, Jide Koka, and myself on behalf of Igobi College Old Boys Association, ICOBA, specifically 1974 to 1979 stroke 81 set to which Abimbola Ogubanjo belonged. Abimbola was one of a kind. He was fun-loving, serious, strategic, noble, humble, industrious, and God-fearing. A worthy ambassador of his family name. Bimbo, in his teenage years, effortlessly boarded down for buses from after-school lessons in the Butemeta to a papa GRA. We also enjoyed school lunches together at the Southern Gate of Ibobi College, eating our iconic, well, what we called dog meat with other classmates. As young teenagers, we played and enjoyed most sports. Bimbo excelled in many, including swimming, running, football, and cricket. He was very competitive, but always fair, honest, and kind. Some classmates shared a swimming coach with him and took part in weekly competitions at his house. Others played football with him at the Domingos, I recall. Bimbo, as we grew older, developed and maintained his passionate view that Nigeria must and will succeed. He started out as a cautious but playful character who suddenly realized his calling. Notwithstanding all that his father had achieved, he was committed to improve upon it. This is evident in what he too has achieved. And gladly, he became our own corporate guru. He had style, he had personality, and every one of his friends was given a pet name. He loved his food, his bright, bold dress colors, old jams and dancing. He was also a serial TikTok WhatsApp dropper. That is, he had a clip to post at all times. Bimbo's loyalty and commitment to friendship was one that was unflinching and remained unabated throughout the time we knew him, over 40 years. He was friendship personified. His favorite word to describe someone was Ogbenye. He was committed to being a positive influence to the progress and growth of his alma mater, Igobi College. He was sensitive to the needs of family and friends. And in this regard, helping and giving back to his friends, community, state, and country was important to him, recognizing how fortunate he had been. Bimbo collaborated with Buega Domingo over the past few years on a health initiative for the betterment of our society. Through the Cervical Cancer Free Nigeria Group, enlisting the help of Dr. Larry Tejosho and some other friends to fight a cancer that is ravaging women throughout Nigeria, killing thousands yearly. Bimbo will be greatly missed by us all. His willingness and dedication to champion good causes 
whether those of individuals or our association was exemplary. And he did it very promptly. We'll miss his boisterous and hearty Babadegba laughter, even though he wasn't a gua. And his ability to turn up unannounced when he was least expected, just to be there to lend support. His last physical interaction with us was at the Igbobi College Founders event on Sunday the 4th, February 2024. And I recall him engaging almost everyone in his typical jovial but dignified self. We did not know then that it would be our last goodbye. Bimbo, you lived a blessed and impactful life. Your legacy stands tall and enviable. May God Almighty comfort all your loved ones, especially your family. Rest in peace, our cherished friend. Sunrio Bamofi Abimbola Ogubanjo, our jughead, our noble one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kainde Mayo Kasumi. The next person to give a tribute, and I hope he's going to cheer us all up, is Mr. George Itomi. On the 18th of February, he would have been having a great party, and Bimbo would have been there celebrating he and his twin on their 70th, but um, not to be. He was Bimbo's father, handed him over to George in their chambers when they started, he started his journey in corporate law. But that's for George to tell you. Thank you very much and good evening everyone. Bimbo, Bimbo's loss is very personal to me. Um, when I first met his dad, the great Chief Ogubanjo, in 1979, he didn't ask who I was, where I came from. He interviewed me and gave me a job. Not only did he give me the job, he mentored me. He never called me, it was never an employer-employee relationship. He called me judge. And in no time at all, he absorbed me into the family. And this accounts for the closeness I have for the entire Ogubanjo family. In fact, I consider myself one of them. And because Bimbo took over the reins of Chris Ogubanjo LP, he, I interacted more frequently with him. From having knowledge sharing sessions, as was rebuilding the firm, it brought about a lot of nostalgia dealing with the memory of such a great chambers that has produced some of the finest lawyers you can think of. And at that time, that firm dared where nobody else went to in commercial law practice. And it's to our eternal gratitude that God gave us such a person. Then enters Bimbo. And you wonder with such big shoes by his father if he could fill them in. And he at some point perhaps doubted that he could. But I'm sure you all believe that Bimbo carved out a niche for himself. Because we're speaking about Bimbo in his own right, not in the shadows of his father. And that's what particularly delights me. When his father passed, we talked about it. He called me. I was actively involved with the planning. Um, we went doing so many different things, but no detail missed him. He would want to find out if something had been done. Um, George, please, could you reach the secretary to the governor? Um, we need this. We need to get stuff done. And we just continued like that. So in doing my tribute at the time to Chief Ugubanja, I called the tribute the grace to flourish because God granted Papa the grace to flourish. And I think about Bimbo, and I said, what did God do for Bimbo? And I said, God gave him the honor to soar. 
Because in 61 short years, he swore. And you've heard all the testimonies. If you were at the stock exchange two days ago, you could see this was an eagle in full flight. And from wherever he is today, he's looking down. He's free. He's telling me, George, I'm free. I'm free. So let's worry about ourselves. Bimbo was a patriot to the core. My last active interaction with him was when the business community from India visited. And he was with the Minister of Trade and Industries, and everything was all about investments. How do we get things done? He was very active in all his thoughts and his prayers for this country. And I know that in these difficult times, he would very much have loved to be part of the solutions we're all preferring. But God had different plans. I want to say to the entire family, there's absolutely nothing to worry about. Yes, we will not see him physically with us, but the memories and all the good things you have had must propel you. Like wings, like the wings, wind under your wings, you must continue to keep Bimbo's memory alive. For me, and for those of us who are proud alumni of Chris Ogubanja and Co., we will play our part to ensure that that great firm continues to play its role in, in what God has carved out for it in the annals of this country. We look again, and I say to you, don't worry. Bimbo is free. Let us just worry about ourselves. May his blessed soul rest in perfect peace. Thank you very much, Mr. George Otomi. This gives us an opportunity to very quickly and briefly welcome those distinguished personalities who have joined us today. And it's so important for the family that this, your presence here is very important, not just for Bimbo, but for the whole Ogubanjo and Kuku families. As we know, this isn't just an official role, it's very personal to you as well. So welcome His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Songwolu. His Excellency, the Executive Governor, First Lady of Ogun State, Mr. Prince Dapo, and Mrs. Bamidele Abiodun. We welcome also the former Governor and former Senate President, Dr. Bukola Saraki, and Mrs. Tony Saraki as well. We welcome the Chief of Staff to the President, the Right Honorable Femi Bajabia Miller. Thank you, sir. The former Governor of Anambra State, Mr. Peter Obi. The former Governor and former Minister, Otumba Ni Adebayo, I'm sure with his wife. The former Senator, Florence Ita Giwa. Distinguished Senator Gershom. Bassi. Now, there are so many more important guests in the front row, in this room, and all dotted around. We thank you very much for your presence, and may God keep you all safe and your families too. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the multimedia screens as we bring you more tributes. You know, as we're all growing up, we used to have this thing called NFA. It's called No Future Ambition. None of us believe that we'll be where we are today because we were all just playful boys. Bimbo was a very playful boy too. But somewhere along the line, when he got back to Nigeria, and I think he realized what uh, Papa had done, well, I think something deep inside him just started propelling him. Bimbo was a unifier. By extending his arms of friendship, he unified uh, people. As um, an Ijebu son, he's been very supportive of you know, you know, the community and he's done a lot to put Ijebu land on the world map. Everything about his community, whether his immediate community or the larger community, whatever he does, he does it with passion. He was. Um, instrumental in this new cervical cancer drug that was introduced. And that's it's something that a lot of women 
are going through. And for a man to be passionate about such a cause, it's a big one. He was very passionate about our company, about being an ambassador, a brand ambassador for Better Glass. His experience as the former chair of the Stock Exchange also helped, I think, us to get some very good insights into what's important in terms of corporate governance and staying on top of things. Bimbo and I met in 2011 when both of us joined the National Council of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Uh, Bimbo's contribution to council were immense, but by 2017, when he became the president of council, the first priority was to complete demutualization, which he succeeded in doing. Because you know, demutualization was probably taking the company into a listed company. There are several vested interests. And pilot that demutualization to completion wasn't a, um, a, main, a main feat. It was a lot of work. The fact that people could trust him, I think, was really important in keeping all of the stakeholders focused on that time and that purpose. He was versed in all manners of in the capital market, any areas that required extra effort, he was prepared to put in the effort. And then he retained that ceremonial aspect of the stock exchange. He obviously was an erudite lawyer, but um, he had quite a number of pro bono cases that, you know, he had put forward and probably helped people in. Bamofi's impact reverberated through Nigeria's financial landscape as not only a legal luminary and capital market savant, but an innovator in his space. His innovative ideas and unwavering dedication revolutionized the industry, leaving a very indelible mark that transcended mere professional accolades, testifying to his boundless passion and pursuit of excellence. When he has a passion, like he had a passion for the country, he doesn't take it lightly. In recognition of his various contributions, he received many awards, including the most recent one, the OFR, uh, Officer of the Federal Republic. He embodied everything that is great about Nigeria. And with more people like him out, out and about being ambassadors for Nigeria, the place would be amazing. We are going to miss him. Our board will miss him. Nigeria is going to miss him. Uncle Abimbola certainly lived a very good life, um, a life where he made impact. Um, we don't have all the answers. The Bible says that the secret things belong to God. It says, but the things that are revealed, they belong to us. For those of us that remain, we'll continue the journey he started. we we'll run the race he ran, he started, and we'll finish the course in Jesus' name. To take us further in this service, please let's receive precious Emmanuel as he sings the song, goodness of God. All my life you have been 
Thank you very much, Precious Emmanuel, for that wonderful rendition and a reminder of the goodness of God at all times. Our tributes continue with a very, very good friend of Bimbo's, Mrs. Shola Koka. Now, you must encourage her to come up here. Her husband has been sitting with her to encourage her all afternoon. But if you do it, she'll find it a lot easier to come up here and talk about her friend very briefly to all of you. Good evening, everybody. Um, that I'm standing here and speaking about Bimbo in, this, in the past tense is a nightmare. But here we are. Abimbola was a good friend of 37 years or so. I first met him when um, we were all in London, met him very loosely. And then later on, when he came, we attended the same university and we became very good friends. And until he passed, we were brother and sister. What I know of Abimbola is he was very proud of his heritage, the fact that he was a, an Ijebu man, the fact that he attained the title, the Bamofi of Irmo. He was very, very proud of that. He was very proud of his pedigree, the, the Ogubanjo name, his entire family, his siblings, his father. Abimbola loved his father so deeply. Everything Abimbola did, everything he achieved, it was because his family was behind him. That was the, that was the, the, what pushed him to be the best version of himself. He wasn't, I mean, I say he was very proud of his pedigree, his heritage, but he wasn't a proud person, he wasn't proudful, he wasn't arrogant, he was very humble, he was very kind and he was very considerate. For me, consideration is more important than being decent. When you're considerate, it means that you won't do unto others what you don't want them to do to you. And Bimbola was very considerate in everything that he did. He hated strife. He didn't, where, wherever there was any discord, Abimbola would go out of his way to find a resolution especially if they were his people. I miss Abimbola. I miss Krego. I hardly called him Abimbola, only if we're having arguments. I always called him Krego. And when, I get, when, I, when I'm beginning to feel overwhelmed, I remember Abimbola saying, Asholi, kumaleto yeo, amagbafolong niyo, mudeti bafolong. Abimbola loved Titi, Ladu, and Timi very dearly. He loved all his siblings and spoke so fondly of them. I know that Abimbola is in a better place, difficult as it may be, we have to accept. We miss him, but I also know that he led a very accomplished life. Almost as if he knew that his time wasn't that long, so he packed so much in. He's left a very good legacy for his family. I'm extremely proud of Abimbola. The way he's conducted himself in the time that he was here with us is commendable. Very humble, very kind gentleman. Sunreo, 
May your soul rest in perfect peace. Amen. Thank you very much, Mrs. Shola Koka. We now have a tribute from one of Bimbo's nieces, possibly the tallest of his nieces, Mrs. Wumi Williams. And I'm sure those who know her knows, uh, know that her smile is almost as broad as her uncle's whenever she smiles. And she's going to smile now as she delivers this tribute to Uncle Bimbo. A big round of applause for her. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I was told to write my script. If not, I'll go on forever. <laughs> Uncle Bim was my mom's baby brother who, who always had her back. This loss struck us deeply and unexpectedly and it hurt very deep. Yet we are comforted by these scriptures in Matthew 24, 36, which reminds us no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, not the son, but only the father. And we are also reminded by the scripture in Philippians 1.21 that says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uncle B, you ran your race, and you gave your best on earth. We are consoled by the belief that heaven is the reward for believers. We, your nieces and nephews, fondly referred to you as the glue, the one passionately concerned with legacy, and keeping the family together. You supported each of us personally and professionally, always reminding us of the importance of unity and that family is our legacy. My entrepreneurial journey owes much to you. You were my legal advisor for over 20 years. You consistently motivated me, advised me, and guided me at every single step. You would jokingly caution me, <laughs> Womsta, majak anybody cheeto, it's wild out there. Emphasizing your desire for all of us to succeed in life. You stood for integrity, justice, and fairness. Uncle, you were a warrior. Defeat was not in your vocabulary. You were filled with knowledge and wisdom. You fought for every single one of us till the very end. You stood for your siblings and you made sure that there was unity amongst all seven of them. You would always say, do not go by, do not, do not, do not guess, always go by facts the, and the law, not emotions. Uncle, you are more than an uncle. You are one of my biggest supporters. You believed so much in me. I vividly remember the day guests came to honor Papa. You called to ensure I met some dignitary saying, Wombs, you got to make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> Reminding me that the path to greatness is not an easy one. You connected the dots for many, impacting lives and giving your best daily. On the night before your departure, in reference to our last conversation, you said, a love for, I can't speak to you about that one, <laughs> a love for Koe Bale, Kisera, Sarah, all will be well and I tried my best. May we be comforted that indeed all will be well. I am grateful you hosted the Thanksgiving party in December, wanting all family members from the diaspora and close friends to attend. Little did we know that we would come to refer to this as your farewell. Thank you for being an ever-present uncle. From, my, from celebrating my 25th birthday in Barbados, to sailing on the Sea of Capri for your 50th birthday, to visiting my family in Atlanta when a child was born. You were ever if present and a family man. You were filled with love and laughter, fun loving. My girls still rave about the Christmas barbecue, how you set the music surround system for them so that they could be the coolest kids. Uncle, we will miss you dearly. Your timeless legacy and memories will forever live on. We, your family, will continue to be there 
for your beautiful and dedicated wife. I remember those phone calls when you say Woomsta and Yara social media. Make sure you post your auntie. We will be there for your auntie. We promise to stand by our cousins, Ladu and Timmy, as they navigate through the journey of life. So help us God. Sleep well in paradise. May your soul and the souls of all the departed rest in his eternal glory. Love you, your flower girl, Womster Baby. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wumi Williams. And of course, we acknowledge the fact that sometimes you have to rip up those traditions that we have in Yoruba land. And her mother is here with us today, as well as Bibo was the youngest of his siblings. And some of his elders are also here. We thank you for continuing to honor him. The next tribute is from Mr. Biodun Kuku. He was brave enough to hand over his sister to Bimbo. So Biodun, over to you. <clears throat> Good evening all. I can't believe we're here, but here we are. My dear Igmo, Bimbo was uh, my brother-in-law, but in all honesty, he was more than an in-law. He was a true brother to the core. I met my big bro many moons ago. I think I was around age seven when we lived in London, uh, 50 Branson Square. Bimbo was besties with uh, my older brother, Femi. So he would often come around the house, usually at night. Uh, sporting an afro with a hint of jerry curls, looking super smooth. In some tight leather pants, a silk shirt without a wrinkle in sight, with only two or three buttons done up, about here. And to conclude the Teddy Pendergrass look, there was always a heavy gold chain to finish off the attire. Then before you could say Jack Robinson, Femi and Bimbo would disappear into the night with, the, with their likely destination being either string fellows or Gulliver's nightclub. <laughs> where they would boogie on down to the break of dawn. There was always something that intrigued me about Bimbo and uh, Femi's relationship when growing up. And this was the fact that they were able to have full-blown conversations without putting a single sentence together. For example, it would go something like this. <clears throat> Mommy, bee. Ah, ah. <laughs> okay. What's you? Hmm. 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 Iro. Oluwao. Ogbeni. Shotiye. Shotiye. Hmm. Shomo. Mami Jekashi. Abimbola had a wonderful gift. He was an engager. He could instantly strike up a conversation with a complete stranger and captivate them in seconds. He had this warmth and disarming quality that would make any room smile. 
Bimbo beamed with positive energy. He was the light in the dark. I would sometimes call upon his counsel to seek advice on personal and business matters. As soon as I called, he was there. He would say, Check Arira. Sure, you come to my bunk. Once in his presence, he would then begin to diligently examine the issue at hand, carefully analyzing, criticizing, dissecting with the ultimate objective of rendering a resolve. Abimbola was solution driven. He never saw any obstacles. With Bimbo, there was always a way forward. On a personal note, I had a dream the other night, which I shared with my sister Titi. <clears throat> In the dream, Bimbo and I were sat around a magnificent swimming pool. And I believe he wanted this message passed on to each and every one here. He said this, and I'm not nuts, by the way, in case anyone's thinking, what the hell is he? Ensure the rest of your time is well spent. Enjoy your time. Use it wisely. Touch lives and not things. Titilola, Ashanyadi, Aribike, Adonla, Oladuni, Ulurotimi, Ayomide, and the entire Ogubanjo clan. On behalf of the Kuku family, please accept our deepest condolences. Ijabu has lost an illustrious son. Till we meet again, Bamufi. Abimbola, <clears throat> Ulurutimi, Uluwa Krieg, my Egbon, my guy, rest in perfect peace. Amen. Thank you very much. Sabiyo Don Kuku. Well, you saw how your uncle handled himself. So, Ladu, and to me, Craig's jewels, daddy's girl, and daddy's boy, your turn, together. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a big thank you for all for coming tonight for the service of songs for my dad. My father, Abimbola Gubanjo, the former chairman of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, was not just a figurehead in my life. He was the embodiment of greatness, a patriot and a statesman. His influence transcended the professional realm and permeated the very essence of what it means to be a compassionate and principled individual. In his actions towards me, my sister and my mother, he demonstrated the true essence of manhood. His unwavering commitment to family values and the genuine care he showered upon us left an indelible mark on my understanding of love, responsibility, and integrity. The lessons he imparted were not confined to the confines of our home, they extended into his business decisions, serving as a testament to the importance of ethical leadership. The conventional wish for every child is that they witness their parents aging gracefully, becoming a source of wisdom and guidance in their lives. However, fate 
sometimes has different plans. And in my case, I find myself grappling with the bittersweet reality that I must now praise God for the time I had with my dad. The journey of grieving is a complex one, filled with countless emotions. Yet, as I reflect on the valuable moments spent with him, I can't help but feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude. I'm grateful for the laughter we shared, the challenges we overcame together, and the quiet moments of understanding that required no words. As I bid farewell to my dad, I hold on to the belief that his spirit continues to rest in perfect peace. His legacy lives on, not only in the professional achievements he attained, but more significantly, in the immeasurable impact he had on the lives of those fortunate enough to know him. In his honor, corporations will rise bearing his name. Foundations will be formed and stand as a testament to his legacy. And as long as I breathe, his memory will endure an eternal flame of remembrance and inspiration to everyone in this room. Amen. May the memory of his kindness, wisdom, and love be a guiding light for us all as we navigate the journey ahead. Thank you. Very well done, Timmy and Ladno, of course. Both of them, next to their mother, we won't have much to worry about. They certainly fit very well into their father's shoes. Ladno, a little less so, perhaps, but uh, nonetheless. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there are many people in this room who are no strangers to tragedy and to the passing of loved ones, and we recognize that. This was a tragic incident, and it wasn't just Mimbola Ogubanjo, whom we all love. And on behalf of Titi Ogubanjo, I'd like to acknowledge to all of you their feeling of loss also of Herbert Wigwe. Chizoba Wigwe and Chizi Wigwe, as well as, in fact, the two young men who unfortunately were in charge of that helicopter. May all their souls rest in peace. Can we rise for a minute of silence to recognize that we have all lost someone very dear and important to us? Thank you. May the souls of the dear departed rest in perfect peace. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Demola Akinrile, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, has the very difficult task of presenting a eulogy to Bimbo Ogbanja this evening. I'm going to ask him to come up. A close family friend and a friend through some of their activities, both legal and otherwise. And we welcome him here today. Thank you very much, Inka. Your Excellencies and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to take you back in a little bit of history 
Do you remember the 1970s, the years of prosperity and the golden era of Nigeria? One man that seemed to symbolize that picture for many professionals was Chief Chris Ogubanjo. And my father, like most fathers who wish inspiration for their children, sometimes need to take them to an uncle or a friend so that they understand the potential of what could be achieved. So on a Saturday in April 1973, he carried the whole family, we went to Danfodio Road, which was more like a country home in Lagos. I walked in and I saw the warmth of a man, Chief Kuzugu Banjo, of paternal nobility. Standing beside him was Auntie Hilda, a lady of maternal dignity and hospitality. And everybody else there was so tall. Senator, um, Sister Yemi, Mosu, everyone. And I looked in the corner, feeling a little bit out of balance. Then I saw a young boy who was more my height, with the potential, of course, to exceed me, but then he was still short. Twinkling with mischief, and he came and pulled my hands. Before I knew it, I was upstairs in his bedroom, going through Archie Comics and, uh, and Juggernauts, which is where he got one of his nicknames. Before I knew it, we were downstairs in the swimming pool. And as we left the pool, the old men were playing tennis who became ball boys. And I saw this energy and warmth, which became the bond between the two of us. And I think because of that energy and versatility, Chief Chris decided to chart a particular educational pattern for him. So he started first with the Gobi, where he acquired the ruggedness. And I'm sure many Gobians were here. He saw the ruggedness was a bit too strong, so I had to take him to Somerset to get some smoothness. It's where he met Moonshine, Dapojora, etc. And then he took a very unusual decision. He sent him to Switzerland to acquire European sophistication and suaveness. And of course, the ability to deal with the world. But inside that decision, because it was an American school, he also acquired American audacity. So you can see in those strains and strands, the foundation of what made Bimbo Gubanjo a very versatile and a very open-minded individual. Now, armed with that quality, we all approached London in the 80s. Now, the 80s was like a scene from the Godfather movie. You had different families. You had the European family like Bimbo Gubanjo representing it. You had from America, Fei Bali representing the American family. You had Larry Tejo Osho coming into London and encroaching onto the territory there with the Lagos family. I was there as, Le as the London family. And of course, you had Matamba, who wore the cap of Lagos and America. So, sorry, of London and America. So we're not quite sure who he represented. Whilst we all had our diverse occupations in terms of our studies, we we're all bonded by one pursuit, what I would describe as the pursuit of beauty. It was the battleground to win the hearts of the finest two men in London. And everyone was very active. But Bimbo, you could not really see visibly where his endeavor was. All you heard was that a woman of beauty and height had had her heart infiltrated. And through the grapevine, you knew that Bimbo had been around. And I tried to analyze what was his psychology. And I figured it out. He was a man that was very partial with beauty, but he was very afraid of the perils of beauty, the risk of unrequited love, one of the greatest troubles you have at that age, failing your exam or having your heart pierced. So he was very risk averse, so he ensured that he moved very consciously. When we left London and we now came back to Lagos for the pursuit of matrimony, that philosophy abided. All of a sudden, he was spending an inordinate time in the house of the most genial and kind of Ben Yoja of Ijebuland. We thought it was because of his relationship with Femi, but rumors were abound that the younger, elegant and charming daughter of, of, of the Ogbeni Oja had distracted him to the point of almost madness. He didn't know where he was going. And we didn't exactly know what was going on until, of course, the whole thing was pregnant with mystery, as you can imagine. But you know, the womb of time often reveals the truth. And before we knew it, announcements were made that the two noble families of Ijebu were going to be joined in matrimony. And this is where I come in. So I get a phone call from Bimbo. I want you to be my best man best man? I said, okay. Now, the best man is an advocate for the groom. He's also a witness. And whilst the drama of that marriage, which was very glorious and very nice, was going on, there was a subplot behind that drama. And that was a plot by Bimbo and Titi to set me up or to match me with the bride's, she bridesmaid, who was the first cousin of the bride, the then dark beauty Tolu Oshiro, as, it was, as she was then known. But of course... 
But of course, as an aging bachelor, I was conscious of my malady. I knew that the time was up. So unknown to them, I had made my overtures in advance. So whilst they were plotting, there was also a subplot by myself. <laughs> and I'm reminded of the Shakespeare saying that the robbed who smiles has stolen something from the thief. And I had the last, I had the last, and to, the, to, to, to my internal gratitude, I'm very appreciative of that. Then the next phase, we come back to Nigeria. The business of living has to start. There's a wife and two beautiful children, the sweet Ladu, and also Rotimi. And we sat down together. I pursued the path of being an advocate. He was a solicitor, but he was restless. And to understand Bimbo's trajectory, you have to understand his character. On one of those evenings when the old men were talking about their children, Chief Ogumhan just said, and I'm sure Musa and Ko probably won't know this. He said, I'll be in Bola. Exam him, Bo. I have a manja. Buyoti Kawi. But I pass. Exam me to what? I have to ja. I pass. So you underestimate Bimbo at your peril. He's a man who I describe as carrying muscles of intuition. And he had this faculty of connecting the chains of opportunity. He saw it very clearly and he took his opportunities. And that is Abimbo Logubanjo for you. Biodun has described him in terms of his temperament or his, or his expressions. If you are talking to him, if he agrees with you, he would look wisely and say, hmm. If you are speaking profoundly and he agrees. When he disagrees, his eyes will roll. He will still say the hmm, but his eyes are rolling. His head, are, his head is tilting backwards. And then he will explode into an objection with drama and Yoruba proverbs. And then you know exactly the position in which he's taken. Now the trajectory from where he was as a lawyer to being a corporate board member, to being a chairman, a council member, and ultimately the president of the stock exchange was the effect of his prudence. He saw as an objective that the object of life was to have an object that was clearly attainable in space within a limited time maximum results and proportionate and relevant effort, not over effort. He targeted what he wanted to do and he achieved it. And when he arrived at that, you saw him at the very zenith of his professional career. It was a beautiful thing to see. You saw his whole six foot presence, which was a vessel that carried a lot of wisdom and a lot of learning. If you pointed him out, this was the president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, you were proud. In his several suits that reflected his English education, his snow white hair and his white beard that reminded you of a European aristocrat. The audacity where he could go with good ideas reminded you of his American education and the ruggedness by which he could deal with anyone brought back the foundation of Igbobi. <laughs> now at the height of that promise, at the height of that promise, there is what I call the treason of fate that accounts for the unaccountable twists and turns in a man's life. And we all woke up two and a half weeks ago to the incarnation of a tragedy that we could not compose in fiction or in life and traumatize a whole generation. Speaking for myself, I was reminded of the, pa the, the pastor of St. Paul's Cathedral. In fact, he was a dean then. St. John's, um, his name was John Don. Of course, no accident that we're in Pastor Paul's cathedral today. And he thundered and said, the death of every man diminishes me. And you know why? At a funeral service, because I'm involved in common humanity. And I said, this goes beyond John Donne. This creates a crisis of confidence in humanity and raises questions such as what is the value of our lives? Is it transient in its relevance or is it of everlasting value? Of course, it's a subject for Pastor Paul where reference will be made and in deference to him, I trust he will deal with it with appropriate reverence. So I shall not press the point too much, but I would say from a secular point of view that he achieved his purpose in life. And a man who achieves his purpose in life, you have to reconcile the answer on the side of a matter of everlasting value. And that is the essence. But more importantly, he was a very lucky man in 61 years of life to unify what I call the unity of the blessings of existence. You are born well to loving parents who had capacity and opportunity. You were in the bosom of beautiful siblings where there was no real sibling rivalry. They understood you. 
You found love in her life with your wife. You had the ability to parent children with so much tenderness. You had a variety of friends. You had a professional pinnacle that you were able to arrive at. You had sufficient financial security in a lifetime. You had good health and you found your faith. What more does a man have? He got the first class. You might have wanted to have a double first. And as I'm trying to conclude, I'm feeling, Bimbo is telling me, you were my advocate as my best man, and I want you to do a task here that would be indelible to the minds of my loved ones. And I'm trying to find out what is there to say. I've said it all. It says, yes, you have given a fair panorama of my life. I said, but Pastor Paul is going to finish that. He says, no, render a secular expression of a spiritual thought. And I'm trying to work out what he wants me to say. And if you know Bimbo, he is very insistent when he wants something. He doesn't keep quiet when his own matters are at hand. He's very involved. And he say, say it. And what I think he's trying to ask me to say, because as an advocate, I'm trying to go into his mind, is that I who lived in the exuberance of human happiness, I am sitting in the felicity of heavenly blessings. And I'm not happy with this sense of doom and gloom that is pervading around me. So tell them. And I'm trying to wonder, what is the indel... He says, go on and find an indel... Find something in poetry or in literature. And I remember the play by Andrew Lloyd Webber called Evita, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. The, 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 the lyrics of that song, which is the idea of Eva Peron, who was so loved and died prematurely, and the whole of Argentina was thrown into one morning. And she said... I have never left you. I kept my promise in my lifetime. There shall be no distance, and I'll always love you. And I'm going to speak as if I was bimbo, and I'll say, he wants me to say to Titi, that you enchanted me with your beauty and your style in your lifetime, but now I want you to bring out your resilience and your resources, and your, and your, and your resourcefulness. He says to Ladun, who's been very demure, as a young girl, very witty and very humorous. Those careful whispers over time as a father is going to guide you and you continue to be, it will continue to be audible and you continue to see it. Rotimi, you've proven today you have graduated. And like our great grandfather, who was a priest, our grandfather, who was a lawyer, and me, there is a magnet of wisdom that is congenital that moves from generation to generation. When they asked the great philosopher Socrates, how come you're so wise that you know so much about Homer? He says, no, I'm just a transmitter from Homer. And therefore, my wisdom comes from someone else. And I will transmit it to people like Plato and to, and to Aristotle and so on and so forth. So you are the transmitter of that generation of wisdom of your father's family. And you will hear it well and you will hear his voice where there's conflict or obscurity. And to my sisters, my beautiful sisters, who I'm the youngest. And I know I wasn't intended to go before you. And I know that the cords of familiarity may sometimes appear strained by my lack of physical absence. But the bond of affection and nostalgia will continue to abide. And you will continue. So going back to the song again, do not cry for me, my loved ones, because I've never left you and you continue to listen. And then to the friends, the legion of friends, he had friends in the spiritual, like Pastor Paul. He had the professional friends. He had the school friends of Igbobi. He had a whole variety. He's saying to me that I was like a weaver who took the embroidery, excuse me, the embroidery of the clothing. the embroidery of the clothing of human variety. And I weaved it into a tapestry of human harmony with different friends who were not friends, but they connected because of me. I want you to continue to maintain your zest for life. The pain will be substituted. Pleasure and happiness will come. And as long as you have those feelings, it will continue to abide. And his final say, do not mourn me in search of lost time. Celebrate me in sweet remembrance of things past. May so rest in peace.
as eulogies go. Very few could hold a candle to that rendered by Dr. Demola Kirile, S-A-N, for aptly capturing the life, the style, and the spirit of Bimbo Agobanjo. Please put your hands together one more time and appreciate Dr. Demola Akirele, S-A-N. And now once more, please turn your attention to the multimedia screens as we bring you more tributes. Enigmatic. Dependable. A leader. Gentleman. He makes all of those things, I don't know, larger than life. Or whatever, whatever role he had to play, he played it well. I've known Bimbola. I've known him since Form 1 in Ibobi College. Abimbola was a very dear friend of mine of over 37 years. From our UK days, you know, he was a man around town, an ebullient, you know, jovial. He had names for different people, and people called him Grigo or Craig. Alfonso Babalegba. And he would see me and just shout, Olusha, <laughs> with a big smile on his face. One of his favorite ways of describing people, especially his contemporaries, is Oberi. He always called me is Aburo, and I would laugh at Titi that she had married an old man. We will always banter and he will go, nah, nah, you know, and that was, that was him. He was one of those that you knew that money had been well spent on him in England and Switzerland because he had a really good taste for the finer things in life. We had a lot of things in common, most especially, you know, in terms of bold dressing, so I want to see what Uncle is wearing, what shoes he's wearing, what, you know, fabric, what's he wearing. That was always a, a, a pleasure for me. If he's wearing the European dress, it's perfect. If he's wearing traditional, it's perfect. You know, he had that about him. Really? Israeli, <laughs> Indian, whatever it is he's wearing, it's perfect. And he had this way of like commanding a room that I didn't quite understand. And I remember you kept going on about how I needed to meet him and then I eventually met him and he's just towering figure and just he spoke and everyone just kind of fell in line in the most you know loving way not authoritative or anything it was very um if you're in a, uh, a gathering and he's in one corner on a table you know that table is probably having the best time in that whole place the energy that he would exhibit was contagious Abimbola was a reliable friend. He had an incredible sense of duty. Somebody that would always be around you. And so, you know, many, many years later, when he decided to marry my cousin, Titi, in many respects, I thought she would always be well looked after. But I think above all, Bimbo was just a truly amazing father to Ladu and to me. And I think the best husband ever is my dear Titi. His commitment to family was unparalleled. Bimbo and his wife Titi, you know, they were the Ashford and Simpson of our own group. Because anytime they enter a place, they're either taking the microphone and dancing. His loss and like the way people have reacted to his loss and felt his loss shows the kind of person that he was. In the short time that he had, he actually accomplished quite a lot. He packed a lot in, almost as if he knew that he didn't have so much time. I just find it hard to say goodbye. To Titi Lola, and most especially to Laduan Timi, God comfort each and every one of you and, you know, console you. You will never walk alone. Great man, just continue to rest in peace. Thank you to everybody that has in some way or the other, whether captured on video or stood here to give tribute to, to in an attempt to capture 
the life, the essence, the passion, the perseverance, the purpose, the intellect, the dedication, the true vastness of the diversity of a great man that we come to celebrate today. T.I.T.I. -T. Ladu and Timi and the entire Ogumbanjo family and Kuku family, our deep condolences go out to you and to everyone who has stood with the families, giving your time and prayer to support them. Thank you. As we continue today's service, I'd like you to kindly receive Sumisola Agbebi as she comes to minister a special number, Bola, which is worthy of a man of such great honor and worth, such as ba Bamofu, Bamofi. You forgive me. I'm just the Jebu princess that was born into the family. I didn't quite grow up there. But to a wonderful man, Abimbola, as we continue the service. Put your hands together and please make welcome Minister Sumisola Abebi. Me, 
Dio Wapa choni mi Sota mi choma Obvio Ayo Iwani yama choni mi Sota mi choma Obvio Wapa choni mi Sota mi choma Obvio Just iwana ma choni mi Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And now, please make welcome the co-pastor of House on the Rock, Pastor Ifain Adifarsen. Jesus. 
truly Jesus is our comforter and the God of all comfort is here today. As has been said by many, the Holy Spirit is the one that can and is able to feel what only you can feel. But he is strong, he's powerful, and he's gentle. And our prayer is that he will continually embrace you with his presence so that even though we go through everything, in his presence somehow there is that fullness of joy. And though you mourn, there is still a hope because God is with you, God is for you, and God will continue to strengthen you and bring you through. It's an honor for me to be standing here today, not just as part of the officiating team of the House on the Rock, but as friend and as sister to Titi and to my dear big brother of Abimbala. It was about 30 years ago that I met a man who introduced me to them in the, I guess I was going through the approval process to perhaps become spouse to this man. And every now and then, it'd be those phone calls that would go on for hours. And you hear, but Craig, but Craig. And you say, Adi boy, Adi ma, it's not like that, you know. And the conversations would go on for a long time where there would be a lot of spiritual um, debates that would go on. But through it all, as has been said by many, every occasion that we had to celebrate, whether it was a joyous occasion, such as a birthday or anything, or perhaps, like last year, the celebration of life of my dear mother-in-law, Mama Hilda de Farasi, Bimbo would show up. He wouldn't tell us he was coming. We probably wouldn't even see him, but you know what he'd do? He'd take a picture of himself to prove that I was sitting there, but you didn't see me, and I snuck in somewhere. Indeed, he's been a faithful friend. He's been dependable. He's been a true friend. He's been a brother to the man that you are about to hear. It's been a tough time for us, as it has been for many, because this is relationship that has spanned many generations, but more than that, a friendship that was deep, a friendship that did everything together. And so I'd like you, as you receive God's servant for the moment, to pray God's strength upon his servant as we receive a childhood friend, one that was pastor, a spiritual mentor in many ways, a confidant and an advisor on many fronts to the man whose life we celebrate today. Please put your hands together and receive the Metropolitan of All House on the Rock Church in the person of the Reverend Paul Ade Farasi as he comes to further today's service. First, giving honor to whom honor is due. The one who to many of us in this room is king of creation. He's the governor of the galaxies. He's the master of mysteries. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is father to the fatherless. And he is husband to the widow. And he's bosom friend to all who trust in him. But he's also the friend of sinners. Otherwise, none of us would have had a chance. Would you join me this evening and celebrate our King for his many bounties, his enormous mercies, his compassions that fail not, his mercies that are new every morning, that finds a way to trace us, to track us, so that we learn to trust him, so that at the end of this human experience, we find the mercy of God and the bounty of the open gates of heaven where he receives us 
as his own children, opens the gates thereof and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And particularly I am joyed tonight in spite of the mixed feelings I have that our brother, our husband, our father, our friend has gone past the pearly gates and perhaps to his shock and awe, he made it home to glory and heard those faithful words that say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Would you one more time just put your hands together for our king, our maker, the one who is our majesty, the head of the kingdom government and serenade him for such a great life. And then you may be seated in God's wonderful presence. Thank you, um, Egboinka, for observing a moment of silence in the honor of the memory of particular members of the Wigwe family. And with us this evening, allow me to acknowledge the presence of Joyce Wigwe, Lady Joyce Wigwe, elder sister to Mr. Herbert Wigwe, um, and also of special mention this evening. in many ways, Herbert's big brother in the industry, the Access Corporation family. Please acknowledge Mr. Aigwaje Aigimokwede. And on behalf of the families, if you will allow me, thank you for the kind moral support, uh, the pillar of encouragement you've been to the Kuku and Ogubanjo families on this side. And we assure you of our continued prayers for your institution and for the Wigwe family. Uh, remain in the grip of our prayers, and we mean that sincerely. To the several captains of industry who are here, um, I'm so used to Kingdom Protocol, please forgive me. I stand on the existing protocols and acknowledge the esteemable presence of the Governor of Lagos State, His Excellency, Mr. Baba Tunde. Sorry, Babajide Sonwulu, you're most welcome, Your Excellency. Also, the governor of Ogu State, where Ijebus come from, uh, Mr. Dakwa, His Excellency, Mr. Dakwa Abiodu, and also, of course, the president of the Ninth Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and his lovely wife, distinguished senator, and uh, Mrs. Bukola and Toy Saraki. Um, and also from the industry, Mr. Femi, Mr. Shego Agbaje and his lovely wife of the Guarantee Trust Company. Also Mr. Jim Ovia Doyen, also in the industry, the creator of Zenith Bank. And Please forgive me, there's a noble Nigerian here, a right honorable gentleman and chief of staff of the presidency of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, my classmate from Igbubi College, Mr. Femi Baja. You're most welcome, sir. Also of Chapel Hill, Mr. Bolaji and Mrs. Kemi Balugu. And Her Excellency, the Ambassador and Special Envoy from Jamaica to Nigeria, Lady Marjorie Grant Fuller. You're all very welcome this evening. Titi, in times like this, there's only one person I know that can bring beauty out of ashes, give us joy in place of our mourning, and turn our pain into power. And what sometimes are those fleeting moments of misery into the great masterful ministry of those who are acquainted with trouble and pain so that when others pass through that time, the same God that brought them through will use you to bring others through. And Rotimi, I believe that God has a lot to say to you this evening and um, God gave something special to you in your precious Father. And I believe that because the seed of the righteous will be mighty in the earth, we watch, we wait, we coach in the sidelines, and we will enjoy watching you grow and grow and fill your father's shoes beyond what he could ever imagine. And he'll be in the sidelines cheering you on from above. 
at Ladu. You have a great father in him. And the beautiful thing about fathers is their voice lasts forever and forever. And all the days of your life, you will hear his whisper, his counsel resound in your ears. And to my Agmoz in the Ogubanjo family, God is with you. And he blessed us all with an incredible last born. And what a champion. And his pride and joy was always every single one of you. May God bless his memory. And as we go away from this memorial this evening, we, we take away many precious memories. If you will, allow me to go to the Word of God and give some perspective to what we are challenged with this evening. And I'll be reading from Second Samuel, the third chapter and the 38th verse. But first of all, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11a. It's our custom to stand for the reading of the Word of God. We stand for kings, for potentates, for presidents, for leaders. But there's one more important than them all, and he is the living word. And his word is life-changing, it's transformational, it's salvational, it is phenomenal. And I read from Ecclesiastes 3, if you don't have a Bible, that's all right. We have the information for you on the screen. Chapter 3, verse 11, New King James Version of the Bible. And I read just the A clause of the 11th verse. Solomon writes, I read, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has planted eternity in the hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. 2 Samuel, chapter 3 and verse 38. David is on his deathbed when the chronicler records this and says, And the king said to his servants, Know ye not, sorry, David is not on his deathbed, that's another scripture. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel. My subject this evening is the blessing of timeless legacy. Let's bow our heads in a brief word of prayer. Our Father, for the baton and the mantle that you vested over a century and a half ago in the life of the grandfather and perhaps others in the ancestry of the Ogumbanjo clan, we give you praise. We thank you that in part, Abimbola has run with that baton. He's fought a good fight of faith. He has kept the faith and he has now finished his part of the relay and has laid up for him that crown of righteousness in heaven. And for those to whom the baton falls in this room, many on the periphery of his work that must continue and those in particular who carry on his assignment in the lineage of his family we ask that you speak succinctly to us and give us heaven's perspective of this thing called passing from one life to another as you ready us for our roles furthermore in this assignment here on earth Bless your word to our understanding and help us to comfort the family. In Jesus' name. The people of God said a very big amen. amen. You may be seated in God's presence. Fruit, they say, never falls far from the tree. It is no wonder that every Ogumbanjo and Kuku that you have met embody the principles and the values not only dear to the Ijebus, but also very dear to the God of creation. And so in all of them, you see the light of Christ shining in a special way. You see the values and the principles, the maxims that their parents bequeath to them over the course of their personal development. It is also important to note that inheritances are more than material things. In fact, the greatest inheritance that we can gain or get are the values that our forebears grant to us in the course of training, development, and raising up children in the way that they should go. So that when they are old, they do not depart from it. You can take all the wealth away from any of the members of this family 
but they will regain it because of their real sense of wealth. It's not the acquisitions, and nor was it for Abimbola. It's the values that they carry. And this is something very lacking in our country. It's lacking in our systems. It's lacking in every hall and every institution in our land. But it's because of noble families like this that Nigeria has a hope. It has a possibility for a genuine future so that we all can bequeath to other generations a nation whose builder and maker is God. And it must be first in our sense of priorities so that we can give to our children and our children's children and our children's children's children a nation that God will be proud of and that our children will not say to us, Dad, Mom, what did you do with the opportunities you had? And so we, as we salute a great visionary, a great champion of many causes, a great intervener in the markets of our country and in commercial law, let us remember that there is a frustration to every visionary. Because a visionary will always see far more with his visionary understanding than he or she will have life to walk into. A visionary will always see more with the eyes of their understanding then they will have longevity to fulfill everything that they see. And it causes the visionary to be very frustrated. But it also necessitates the importance of visionaries siring sons and daughters and sires who will continue the race from where they left off. The great apostle Paul of Tarsus said it this way. He said to his godson, a surrogate, a, a, a survivor, a successor, part of his great succession plan, that I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith and now is stored up for me my reward which is the crown of righteousness but Timothy you run your race my legs got tired but it's great that I have sons like you and Thaddeus who can pick up the pace as my feet begin to tire so that the relay doesn't run out and this is why the great nations of the world they have 200 year plans the great states in our country have 50-year master plans and blueprints like my governor or my governors. So that we're not just committing one administration to a cause, to the development of our nation and the betterment of our many generations ahead of us, but that what we are really doing is we're putting relay runners in the relay race. And to every one of our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, we owe not just our ability to run our course, but to ensure that those coming behind us are mentored as protégés who will do better than we have done. When we started this race in the First Republic of Nigeria, we were blessed with incredible leaders. It's happened, but we won't discuss that today. And so, there must be intentionality if we're going to create real institutions that are the bedrock and the stability of any nation so that our nation grows from strength to strength and from glory to glory. The God who created us is a transgenerational God. And he is, to me, the best of master planners. He starts something in one generation with a great grandfather. He starts or continues that one thing in the next generation with a grandfather. He increases what he did with the grandfather with the father. And then he consolidates it with the son. So that the men in this house that I pastor, they are trained that they must develop a 200-year plan. And in fact, to great-grandfathers, we call them great and grand. To grandfathers, we applaud them with the title grand. And to fathers, we give them a slightly more junior title, father. But what is most precious to those three generations is the sons. The Bible says we are worse than unbelievers if we do not leave an inheritance to our children's children. And if you do, that makes you grand. And if you do more than that and leave an inheritance to your great-grandchildren, that makes you greatly grand. And every man here, we must learn the art and the science of a 200-year plan. And it's not the bequeathal of material possessions, that's important, but it's more so the bequeathal of a mandate on a lineage and on a people. 
And this is more important, in my opinion, than life itself. In fact, it's the reason for life. The Jews, as a result, when they refer to their God, they name him by their patriarchs. They call him the covenant-keeping God. So wherever in the Bible you see the capital words, L-O-R-D, it means the promise-keeping or covenant-keeping God. And they call him the God of Abraham, the first one with whom he got a covenant in that lineage. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. But there was more to the lineage. Abraham produced the seed. Isaac passed the seed. Jacob proliferated the seed into 12 sons. The others only had one. And then Joseph preserved the seed. And that's why Judah and his brothers could not die in the famine because Joseph's job was to create an incubator for them in Egypt and took the economy of Egypt to a great height that it became the most powerful nation in the world. And Joseph kept Judah alive in whom Jesus was in his loins. Why? Because he made a promise to a dead man, a man who died more than half a millennia back, and told him, your children will be more than the stars of the heavens and more than the sand on the seashores. And this is what will happen to them. They will eventually be taken captive in a great nation, and there they will incubate to become greater than the nation that habitated them. And then after 400 years, I will bring them out with a mighty hand. Nigeria's deliverer is still coming. What we have now are forerunners, but the deliverer will come. And it might be a scion from your loins. And when we look at the Judean lion, Judah was, I believe, the third son of Jacob. And he fathered Perez, and the generations go on, and then there was Nashon, and then there was Salmon, and then there was Boaz, and then there was Obed, and then Obed sired Jesse, and Jesse sired eight sons, including David, the last born. This position, last born, he shares with you, Rotimi, he shares with your dad, Bamofi, and he shares with me. And this is why sensible nations have a multiple decade master plan. The United States, for example, has a 200 year master plan. The United Arab Emirates has more than a 200 year master plan. Others, at least a 30 year master plan. And looking carefully at lineage, can I draw your attention briefly to Psalm 127 verse 1, verse 3, verse 4 and 5. I trust the media will put that on the screen. And in the opening verse, the psalmist writes, except the Lord builds the lineage, and the word build there is not laborer, it's architect. Except the Lord designs the lineage, they that parent or labor, labor in vain. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman wakes but in vain. So there must be a security plan, and God designs that. Then that security plan is acted out by the watchman. There must be a design to the architecture of a lineage, and the lineages of a nation, a city, or a governing system of families. And the workers there, who are our parents, must work according to that pattern. Otherwise, we work in futility. The second verse, he says, it is therefore vain for you to rise up early in life or early in a day and to sit up late and to eat the bread of sorrows. For God gives his beloved rest. Bimbola can rest. For a long day, because there are no nights in heaven. Because in 60 years, he delivered what most men will not deliver in 100. But he comes from that pedigree of people whose lives contribute vastly to the development of institutions and society. Verse 3, he says, children are the legacy of the Lord. So God is the one with the plan, and he puts different generations in different families to work according to that plan. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's a gift both to us, but it's also a gift back to him. And as arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior, so are children of the youth. Let me do some interpretation with that. 
in the day of David, the greatest warriors had uh, bows and arrows, they had javelins, they had a few uh, sizable catapults. But if they were writing in our day and age, you'd be looking at more the admiral of the fleet, who had uh, a huge aircraft carrier with at least 65 to 70 fighter bombers, fighters and the likes, and at least two destroyers, uh, two frigates, who provided shield and cover for um, the master target in the fleet. And they had several other accompanying ships that could do significant damage and in their missile arsenal they had all kinds of ballistics that hear me friends the Africa Africa command could literally wipe out our nation and that's what God gave you he gave you children he gave you children and that's who we live our lives for Japan came back from absolute ruin after the Second World War but they built back because each generation chose to sacrifice for the next, and that generation sacrificed for the next, and that generation sacrificed for the next. And Japan became great because of their sons and their sons. You are the most precious gift to us, Ladu and Timmy, and to all the sons and sons and daughters of parents in this house. You are the most precious gift to Nigeria. Our job is to shape you. And the Bible says, Titi, that happy is the man that has his quiver full or his arsenal full of them. And they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the adversaries at the gate. There are many adversaries in Nigeria, and I don't speak of people. I speak of symptoms. I speak of troubles. I speak of our economic plight. I speak of our social um, uh, disaster. I speak of the, the pain that's in the country presently. And it is our children who can fix it. And I believe that they will. And this is what we must teach them as their responsibility and as the useful opportunity of their talents, their gifts, the phenomenal education we have afforded them and all that God has in store for them. And quickly, let me cut to a chase. 123 he says children are the legacy they are the gift of the Lord the reward to you Abraham the patriarch we examine today for many years he sought a child that God deliberately made his wife's womb barren for over 25 years that she had no child and then in the disaster of impatience it was the wife who went to Abraham, who was not sterile, and said, go into my house, girl, and sire a son for me there. It's important to note that Abraham was not yet Abraham. He was Abram. Abraham did not sire Isaac. Sorry. Abraham did not sire Ishmael. It was Abram that sired Ishmael. But Abraham sired Isaac. Two different people sired two different men. Abraham was converted to the knowledge of the pre-incarnate Christ. And it was after that conversion that his wife's womb opened. And at a hundred years, he had a miracle rising up from somewhere in his midsection one morning after not having had that for 10 years. That was a miracle. And when he put the seed in Sarah's womb, her womb came back to life. And so we know that seed must have been the pre-incarnate Christ who Judah was carrying, for which reason Joseph went to Egypt so that he could become leader there and then become the helper of that family so that Judah would not die in the famine. This is critical to grasp. Because when it's time for Jacob, or rather Abraham, to sacrifice unto the Lord to prove to God that, God, you are more important to me than my most precious gift. He took Isaac up to the mountain and he was in the downward blow of sacrifice. And God said, hold it! Now, Abraham, I know that you love me more than your son. A few days earlier, he had said to Abraham, take now your only son and sacrifice him. So as far as God was concerned, Ishmael was not the son of Abraham. He was the son of Isaac. There are many things that we birth before we come to a real relationship with Christ. And there are different things that we birth after we come to that relationship. And this is important to underscore. 
But as we go further, and rushing to a close, Abraham had a great servant in the house, and his name was Eliezer. And he begged God, he said, is Eliezer going to be my heir? And God said, no, I will keep my promise with you. You will have a son. But out of impatience and imp impulsivity or in impulsion, his wife convinces him to do the impatient thing and they sire a child that would become the problem of Israel until now. Sila. Sila. I believe it was the 6th of February. What was it? The 9th of February. A great man had left our shores and many of us did not know we would see him or had seen him for the last time. And he boarded a few aircraft on his way to celebration of that great sport, the American Football League or the National Football League. And en route there, perhaps halfway through the flight, when chaos erupted in the cabin, and in the last moments of that flight, I saw pictures of this for a few days. And I believe that there were shouts in that cabin, Jesus, save me. Because Romans 10 and verse 13, Romans 10 and verse 13 says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, rock me to please help me, shall be saved. But there's a reason why they're saved. Verse 14 and 15, if you will help me please, rock media. How then shall they that call on the name of the Lord, whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And verse 15, and how shall they preach except they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the good news of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Sorry to say, much of the church world today does not preach the good news of the gospel. And Mibala and myself, we had several moments over the years. We were known to each other for at least 50 years. And 41 years ago, I came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And from that point on, some of my three closest friends, I made it a point of duty to pray for them regularly and to engage them significantly. And we had many engagements on the subject. And I took time to explain to him this gospel of our salvation. Because to me, it was most important. I did not want to get to heaven and for any of my close friends to be absent. And so the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Apostle Paul of Tarsus said it this way, for me to live is an anointed experience, for me to live is Christ, and to die would be gain. And as he drew his last breath, I believe it was painless, but for a few seconds. And instantaneously, I believe the Lord's angel who knew that Abimbala believed the gospel, he understood uh, the verities of the finished work and its incredible bequeathal to all who believed on our Christ. And he cried, Jesus, save me. And because he had heard the gospel, because preachers were sent to him, I believe that he has entered the city called Foursquare. I believe, my friends, that as the enemy sought to try and transfer the soul from that aircraft, and his spirit also from that aircraft to an abyss of damnation and eternal fire where pain has no ending. I believe that God's angel instantaneously, without travel time, transported him to glory. And as they approached the gates of heaven on the shore of that eternal land where there's no sorrow, there's no night, there's no pain, there's only everlasting joy. 
The gates are not shut, they are open, but they are guarded by a host of angels. And from deep inside your daddy's spirit and soul, the Lord himself said, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And the retort from the guards at the gate said, Who is this King of glory? Because what they could see was my brother, your father, your husband, your friend, your, your brother. Who is this king of glory? Because that's who they could see. Our brother, our father, our husband. And the retort from the master is, he is the king of glory. He's the Lord mighty and strong in battle. His name is the Lord of hosts. And because every fact must be established in two witnesses, the pronouncement was weighed again. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be open, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Why was the king invisible, but Abimbola was visible? Because the king was inside his soul and his spirit, and the gods fell one side to the other and the gushing of the might the glory the power the majesty the compassion the love the the kindness of the almighty god began to radiate and instantly follow my imagination abimbala fell down to the ground and he started to weep tears of joy and wailings of gladness because in some parts of his mind he didn't really believe that this was going to be his eternal destiny. But in the most of his mind, he had faith that he's already brought me home. And he would get up again, and the angels would escort him. And when he got to the very threshold of glory, the gushing of anointing, the power of divine, the divine presence, the glory of God was too much for him to stand. John the Revelator saw this, and he fell to his face. And Bimbo gets up again. And he's in awe, he's in total awe that what one man did on the cross made it possible for me through his shed blood and his sacrifice to make it to this eternal habitation and to live forever in the presence of the Lord. And then he sees Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hezekiah, he sees Moses, he sees Joshua. And the first guy to walk up to him is this sage of a man about this tall. And he says, hi, Bamufi. How are you? Well done. We've been waiting for you. And then beside him, there's another guy. This is Joshua. And he meets all the celebrities of the kingdom of heaven, the great owners of the hall of faith. And he's amazed at the welcome they've given him. He's ecstatic. He's out of them. But how did this happen? Yesterday, I was sharing somewhere. You might know the Oyewale twins, Dotto and Femi Oyewale. They were identical twins into their 60s. They were friends of, of many of our parents here, and they ran uh, different university institutions in our country. And they were so identical that they could pass for each other easily, even to their fiancés and girlfriends, even to the bank teller. So Femi would sign checks for Dotto, and Dotto would sign checks for Femi. Femi would sit exams for Dotto and pass. And Dotun would sit other exams for Femi and pass because they had the same identity, even their thumbprint was indistinguishable, but for perhaps a, a narrow line somewhere in the print. So they could pass for each other exactly. And this is an important principle in understanding the price that Jesus paid on the cross. The price he paid was simply this. He took your identity so that he could take all the judgment for all our original sin, our ancestral sin, our historic sin, and our personal struggles now, and our future sin. He took it all on the cross. You've heard the song that says, lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. For he says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Bunkum. Because lifting up there was not a summons to praise. It was an actualization of the cross of Calvary to which the sacrifice was fastened by nails through the most painful nerves in his body. And then it was jacked up. And then once it was jacked up, he had said in John chapter 12 verse 32, if I'm lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men. The term men is not in the original manuscripts. 
The term men is not there. Why? Because she was going to draw all judgment, which is all in the lining of the context. And so, what did he do on the cross? He took the price for all our, our idolatry, adultery, our lusts, our corruption, our greed, our graft, our stealing, our thieving, our wickedness, our evil, our hate, our bitterness. He took the judgment for all of that on his cross. And when he was done taking all judgment, he said, it is finished. In the Greek, tetelestai, meaning all judgment that belongs to you and I, he extricated it for you and he paid. If we were to monetize it and your, your debt for sin was $3 billion, he paid trillions of quintillions and zillions of dollars. So that no matter what you could accrue, he already accepted it. I propose to you, nobody goes to hell because of sin. We only go to hell for rejecting Christ, whom John pointed out and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away, doesn't cover, he takes away the sin of the world. That's why when the Hebrew would come with the shadow of the Lamb, the priest never inspected the man. He didn't look at the man to see if he had blemishes or spots, no. He looked at the substitute who had the man's identity. And if the lamb was clean, then he could be a worthy sacrifice to take our sins. This I explained to Bimbala many times. Heaven is not for perfect persons. It's for forgiven men and women. And to enjoy that forgiveness that he paid the price for, for all of humanity, it comes by simply believing in him. I believe tonight I'm doing exactly what Uncle Abimbala wanted me to do. It's to give every single person who is deemed as a friend of his, family of his, this opportunity to believe in the Christ that he has believed in. And that's the reason why I believe he crossed the pearly gates. He's in glory. He's in resplendent joy on a level that is unthinkable. He will never know hurt or pain ever again. And of course, when he got there and he met with the master, he asked questions about all of you, but he could not finish any of the sentences. Because before he could speak, the answer was already known to him. And he could see all your mansions in glory. And mansions is a metaphor, using big houses to talk about the new body we get when we get to heaven. And the truth is that we don't go to heaven when we die. We don't have to die to go to heaven. Sound Christian theology teaches that we are seated in heavenly places already. Ephesians 1.3. That he raised us up together to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 2.6. In Hebrews 12, chapter 2, he tells us that we are in the heavenly Jerusalem, not the one in Israel, the one in heaven. And the scriptures repeat with this fact. And so we have dual citizenship and dual presence. So we're spirit beings having an earthly experience, not earthly beings having a spiritual experience. This life is mortal. But what Habimbala did on that Friday night, his immortality put off mortality, his incorruptibility put off corruptibility, his spirit put off flesh, his invisible put off the visible and instantly the veil was gone and he was in the heaven that he bleakly experienced whilst he was here on earth. It's challenging, it's very challenging. But I believe that if he were to speak to us today, he would say, friends, like Paul, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith as best as I knew how. But I finished my course, especially in the markets, in the family, and in our society. I draw your attention to 1 Kings chapter 2, and the first verse, 1 Kings chapter 2 and the first verse. This is what I believe he'd say to many of us, but particularly to wrote to me. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should lapse. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, verse 2, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou therefore strong and show yourself a man. Verse 3, and keep the charge of the promise-keeping God, your God, 
to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper, you may be productive in all that you do whithersoever, whithersoever you turn yourself. I've been here before, Timmy. My father lay in a grave, or rather lay in a, in a casket. And I was brought back into the country and I witnessed his lying in state. And I wanted to scream at him and tempt resurrection power and call him to come back into his body. And wisdom held me from doing that. But that same year, it brought to memory a scripture where the scripture declares, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord and his glory filled the temple and so did his train. Sometimes the greatest of men in our lives upon whom we lean, their presence can obscure the vision of God. Not that it's their intention, but especially since they are so much larger than life. And the moment I came to terms with the perpetual absence of my father until after this life, I began to see and know God personally. And the first thing God said to me after he passed, I get the chance to be the father that you know really loves you and for you to also be my son. So we had two choices or two options, sorry, two opportunities at sonship, being the son of a mortal father. But now, in Christ, the son of the everlasting father, the mighty God. And he's a rock. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's way maker. He's water walker. He's miracle worker. He's heavy load bearer. He's heavy burden shearer. He's your glory and the lifting up of your head. He's your shield. He's your buckler. He's more than all the great father figures that he will give you. Could all be in one. He's the almighty God. And there isn't a human being who could love you, help you, serve you, bless you more than him. And that was just an illustration in all his virtues of the quality of God. And I believe he has given you a legacy. But the greatest legacy, if you'll allow me to be his messenger for a moment, is God. May God be in your life. May God be your strength. May God surround you as the mountains surround Jerusalem. May God be your stronghold in the day of trouble. May God be your shield. Glory, the lifting up of your head. May you discover in him the father of fathers, the greatest of fathers, the greatest of friends, the one who understands you and in spite of all he knows about you, he continually recommends and endorses you. And Ladu, this God I never see in kind before. There's nobody like him. He's absolutely amazing. He's absolutely wonderful. He is counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. And he's prince of peace. And our prayer is in the unfolding of days and weeks and months with each day, the healing power of God will move in all of our lives. This has been the most challenging obsequy that I have had to speak at because Mimbala was not just a friend. He was my brother. We shared more than half a century together and between our families over a hundred years. I mentioned in a tribute that I'm an old Igbobian, so was Bimbala. His father was an old Igbobian, so was mine. They both went to the University of London and attained their LLBs, one at King's College, one elsewhere, but they went to the same inns of court, Lincoln's Inn, and were called to the English bar together. And they came back to practice law in our country. They took slightly different paths, but they sired sons and daughters, like we have sired sons and daughters and it falls to you and it is true and worthy of noting that the seed of the righteous will be mighty in the earth and you will be mighty and with years unfolding you will be more legendary than your father your legacy will be stronger than your father's every time you stand up and go to a board meeting in replacement of your dad you're not on your own papa chris ogumbanjo is there with you uh, your dad 
I mean, Bola Ogubanjo is there with you. Your great granddad or granddad, Daniel, Reverend Daniel Ajayi Ogubanjo, he's there with you. Because when we stand up, it's all the people who influence our lives, uh, whose voices we heard and whose tutelage we learned from, they're with us. And not just that, God is with you. God, the Almighty, He's your standby, He's your paraclete, He's your help from ages past, your hope for years to come, and a very present help in the time of need. Awai yao titi. I believe that you carry a strong baton today. You have to be father and mother, but your shoulders are big enough. And it is times like this into which God excavates hidden treasure, remarkable potential and talent, in which we now discover what we carry that we never knew we carried. It's out of this that greatness is born. Trials, tribulation are summons to the greatness in you, like we are all summoned to help our governors and our leaders to build this country back. We're anointed for that. The Bible actually says that part of our anointing is for the development of infrastructure. Isaiah, I believe, 61 verse 4 or 60 verse 4. I close my thought this evening by asking my friend, brother, Anegbo, many times over, to join me with a microphone and we will pray for the family, as you will too, for the family. And for his legacy, the family at large. A gift to Nigeria, a gift to the markets, a gift to commercial law, a gift to industry, a gift to this society. And I'll ask Egbo Koi, the most reverend, um, come in a moment and to lead us in prayer in the Yoruba tongue and if he chooses to add Ijebu to it he'll be welcome and I'd like the family to remain seated but if you will indulge the Holy Spirit can everybody else stand whilst the entire clan and family remain seated and stretch your hands to them and pour out your heartfelt prayers to the Almighty God for the family. Would you do that for a moment? And ask God to be with them. Ask God to strengthen them. Ask God to turn what the enemy wants to afflict with as misery into ministry. The pain into power. The ashes into beauty. The struggle into success. The confusion that sometimes comes into confidence. Death, where is your sting? For the sting of death, it is the law. Grave, where is your victory? For death, hell, and the grave have been swallowed up in the victory of the cross. Please pray for them. Ask the Almighty God to settle on them. Ask the Almighty God in the richness of his mercy to shower them. Declare concerning them that they will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And in the secret place of the Most High, they shall abide. And that not one member of the family will escape or evade salvation. We have not said goodbye to Abimbola. We've said goodnight. Because one getting up morning, we will all meet him again. Some at different times, but eventually, all who know Christ will come to meet with the dearly departed. I'm sure himself and Papa are having a dance now. And they're very much a part of this service. They're in the cheerleaders crowd who can see into this space and they watch our lives daily. Friends, please agree with the most reverend Koya Jai of the Methodist Church as he leads us in prayer in the Yoruba language. Olorun Oba Olodumare Alagbara Julo Onife Julo Ologo Julo Olorun Oludawa Olugbowa Olu shong bobo funwa. Olorun alagbada ino. Olorun mole. Tofi mole bora. 
Olorun iwo ibi tutu lai lai Olorun iwo ti owo re kan yi laorun iwo orun aruwa ati gusu Olorun oba ti nje imi ni alagbara julo ologo julo onifeju lo Olorun a se kan ma ku Olorun baba wa ati Olorun wa Olorun oludan de wa Olorun awa pe o ni wa ko ti owo yi lati wa dupo lowo re nitori omo re abinbola biga ni oruko re ludumare fun ojo ti a bi omo re biga ni o nitori igbesi aye re biga ni o fun gbogbo to se ni odi aye biga ni oruko nla re fun iyawo ti o fi ta lo re biga ni olodumare fun awon omo ti o fun biga ni olodumare po omo re mo jesus christi awa dupe olorun ba lo re julo ipe ipe omo re si odo re wa gba ope wa wa gba yin wa olorun ba lodumare awa pe owo nchoro mo re titi jesu christ yoko opo wa se oko titi olodumare olutunu wa tu titi ni inu olorun ba iwo bi tutu lai lai je ku tutu fun titi Olorun baba wa ati Olorun wa awon mo re ladun ati roti mi wa se won ni eni yi wa pelu won ni ojo gbogbo Olodumare je ko ma ye won bo se nye ye le ko ma ro won Olorun bo se ro adaba Olorun ko ma ka o ire bi eni ka o bi amodun Olorun Olodumare a pe o ni wa ka ti fun ara nitori ara nitori awon egbon omo ra bi nbola wa sanu fun won wa tun won ninu wa pelu won ni gba gbogbo fun ara ati ore fun ebi ati ojulumo Olodumare wa wa pelu gbogbo wa wa mu ese wa duro ko wa sanu fun wa kire ko ma to wa ki gbogbo wa ki a ma fuju wa ri ri ki a ma fi ti wa ki a ma fi gbo ri ki a ma fi enu wa ki a ma fi so ri a lo yin a ma lo si ju ri ati si ife olodumare e ma lo ri e ma bo ri adara fun yin asun won fun yin nipa agbara ti a fi gbe jesu jinde gbogbo apata la ma jinde ninu jesu christi fun yi ta bere fun ti o ti se ati ti a o bere fun ti o ti se fun wa a wa dupe wa yi olodumare olodumare wa dareji gbogbo wa ese wa si oloro lero ni se ni koko ati ni gbangba wa sanu fun wa wa dariji wa ko wa pale wa ni gbogbo ojo aye wa gbogbo olodumare to ku ninu gbogbo ti a ma se fun omo re wa wa pale wa awon ton lo si erun won ni ola so won de be ni ayo ati ni alaafia ki gbogbo won ko pada si si le won ni ayo ati alaafia kire ko ma ba gbogbo wa gbe ki a ma ba ri gbogbo ojo aye wa fun yi ati ohun gbogbo ti o se fun wa la wa dupe loruko omo re jesu christi oluwa wa amen our father we honor and thank you for the bountiful mercies of the finished work of jesus cross by which when faith is reposed therein we are gifted with new life that lasts forever and ever even when we are no longer in this body we thank you that tomorrow though we lay the earthly tent of our brother father and son 
dust to dust and ashes to ashes. We thank you that he's not there. He's at your right hand in Christ, ever to live forever in the bliss and the joy of the bounties of heaven. For this great gift to humanity, we are thankful. Father, for the legacy he left behind for us to enjoy the institutions that he built, their interventions in our country, and to enjoy the children that he sired, and the wife that he has left behind, not perpetually, but eventually to meet again. We thank you for this community that has shown love and will continue to. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that makes us just and righteous in your eyes so that we have access to you that's unfettered. And for this reality in our brother's life, we are grateful that we do not sorrow as those who have no hope because of the great hope of the Christian church. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the hope of eternity in glory. We give you thanks. But we do suffer a great loss, our Father. Colossal it is to us. Our hearts are broken. Our hearts are yearning. Our hearts yes, miss the dearly beloved. And we need your succor and your help. And we're comforted by this fact of faith that you are the God of all comfort and you know how to comfort us when we are afflicted by this kind of pain. Father, be comfort to all our souls, especially to his next of kith and next of kin, especially his seed and his daughter. Bless them, we pray. We invoke journey mercies upon our travel to Ijebu land and back. We invoke traveling graces and we evoke supernatural strength to support all of us, particularly Titi, Lado, Rotimi, and all his siblings. We thank you for a life well lived, for an illustration of God's grace in a man's life. And we honor you today. And we commend our brother. We say adio, farewell, you great and good servant and Christian soldier. May God bless your memory. May God bless your eternity. And may God fill with the joy of heaven your great heart and comfort our souls at this departure. In the name of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ, the King of glory, we raise this incense as part of the evening sacrifice. May it appease you. May it arouse you, our King open your tent skirts and shadow us in your secret place in jesus name we pray and amen we're fastly bringing the service to a close you may be seated in god's presence the next item is a very brief uh conclusion to the rock media's uh presentations and thereafter we will hear um announcements and then um a brief brief testimony by Iboje Imokwede. He was busy with some matters concerning the obsequies of both for both families and he'll come shortly right after uh, the vote of thanks. But first receive uh, our illustrious Master of Ceremonies, nobody better than him, dear friend and I go to many of us here and Aburo to some, please receive uh, Mr. Yinka Akinkube as he comes uh, to further us expeditiously towards the close. Yinka Akinkube, sir. Please turn your attention to the multimedia screens as we bring you the last set of video tributes. When you are joyous, look deep into your heart and you shall find it is only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again and in your heart you shall see that in truth you are weeping for that.